Well, good morning and welcome to Southland. My name is Lydia and our whole team, we're so excited to worship with you all this morning. If you are new around here, a special welcome to you. We are glad that you're here. We hope that this place feels like home. We started our services by worshiping together. So would you guys stand and let's sing.
sing this up. Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand, but everything around me is shaken. I'm this out. I still got joy in chaos. I've got peace that makes no sense. I won't be going under. Cause I'm not held by my own strength. I built my life on Jesus. Jesus So faithful to us. Let's sing this to him. song. 
great to see you this morning. It's great to worship with you today. If you would, just take a minute, say hello to a few people around you, introduce yourself, then you guys can have a seat. Good morning, everybody. My name is Greg, and I serve as part of the ministry team here at Southland. The fog is lifting. It's supposed to warm up a little bit today, and we welcome that. Yeah, spring, come on, we'll take you. Uh, I want to welcome you here today as well. You know, when we talk around here about the triangle, that's living life with Jesus in community and on mission, that's just a way for us to know as a church um, if we're pursuing our purpose as a church. And so last week, when we gave you the opportunity to live on mission by inviting you to pack one million meals that are going to be sent to families in El Salvador and Honduras, among other places, you responded in big ways. A whole bunch of you raised a hand and said, yes, count me and my hairnet in. I will be there March 15th and 16th packing those meals. And uh, as a result, we ended up filling all of our meal pack positions at our tables. And so that was a really good thing that you responded that way. Yeah, we can celebrate that together for sure. Now, having said that, there's still plenty of roles available. We call these specialty roles. In fact, No meals will get packed without these specialty positions being in place. I'm talking about like our check-in team. I'm talking about our table captains. My wife is going to sign up. Did I tell you, honey, that you're signing up for that this week? She's signing up for that this week. And then we're also going to have our dock and supply station workers. Uh, We really need them. A little bit of heavy lifting involved there. But that's a great role for a sports team or an organization to be a part of. So if you're a coach or you lead an organization, bring your group and serve together in that dock and supply worker position. Keep in mind, when we pack meals, it is a lot of fun, but we're doing a lot of good because the meals provide 75% of a child's minimal daily nutritional needs in one serving. And so that's how important this is. So head on out to the concourse, to the help desk, talk to them about the specialty roles, or you can go to southland.church slash Nicholasville, go to the announcements page, and you'll find out how to sign up for that role. And we'll look forward to seeing you then. Well, very often at the end of our services, we ask you to direct your attention over to the baptistry. Somebody will step down into the water, and somebody will be there with them, and then the person uh, that stepped into the water allows themselves to be baptized, immersed in the water by somebody else. And generally, right before that happens, they'll say something like, I believe with all my heart that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and I receive him as my Lord and as my Savior. We love to celebrate baptisms in this church. What's the big deal about baptism? What's a great question to be asking, especially as we move toward Easter? Because we want to let you know that we are going to be celebrating baptisms this year during all of our Easter services right here in the auditorium so that we can all experience them together. If you've been thinking about baptism, you have questions, come see us. Better yet, On March 17th, I'm going to be hosting a quick Q&A called What's the Big Deal About Baptism in Room E111. It's just down the hallway to the right of the auditorium as you're facing the stage right here. It's going to be between services starting at about 1040. So come see us. Let us answer your question. You can always talk to somebody on the prayer team, and they can take you to the prayer room if you're not able to make that gathering on the 17th. Well, we are wrapping up our teaching series called Top Shelf. Scott Nichol is with us to do that. If you've missed any of these messages, you can always go to southland.church slash messages to get caught up. Scott's on his way out right now, so let's go ahead and join in with our other campuses as Scott comes to teach us today.
All right, quick show of hands today. How many of you have ever been a substitute teacher? Raise your hand high. Okay, good amount, just like last service. All right, put your hands down. Next question. How many of you here today have never once in your whole life ever even considered being a substitute teacher? Raise your hand, hold it high. I'm with you guys, for sure. The other day I received a text message from a friend of mine who was in the middle of substitute teaching. And I'm not sure you're supposed to be texting people while you're doing that, but what are they gonna do, fire you, you know? And so he's texting me, he's telling me about some funny interaction that's happening in his classroom. And we exchange these, these funny text messages, but at the end of that experience, I thought to myself, who does that? Like who voluntarily signs up to be a substitute teacher? Because I don't know if times have changed, but when I was a kid, I remember walking into a classroom and then noticing we're having a sub and just having this sense of diabolical glee come over me. Like, this is going to be fantastic. We can all switch names. We can try out all these pranks. We would just give the worst possible behavior to the substitute. So who in the world would sign up for something like that? Well, the reality is this. The truth is being a substitute teacher is a noble task. I applaud anybody who does it. But an even deeper truth is that Jesus is and was the ultimate substitute. And he received from us far worse than any middle school math class could ever dish out. One of my favorite authors, a man named John Stott, one of my favorite books of his called The Cross of Christ, simply said this. The essence of sin is man substituting himself for God while the essence of salvation is God substituting himself for man. So here's what's gonna happen today. We're gonna kind of wrap up this series, and then next week we're gonna turn a corner toward Easter. And so today's sermon is actually gonna serve as a bit of a prequel uh, to what Easter Sunday is gonna be all about. So if it's okay with you today, we're just going straight to the cross. And to set this up, what I wanna tell you is that if you grew up in the Jewish faith, you grew up steeped in the Old Testament scriptures, if you were to then read or listen to an account of Matthew telling the story of Jesus' crucifixion, as we see in Matthew chapter 27, a lot of it would start to sound very familiar. You would start to experience a lot of deja vu. In particular, your mind and your heart would probably turn toward the Psalms, specifically Psalm 22, which of course, after Psalm 22 is the 23rd Psalm, which is all about the good shepherd, but the 22nd Psalm is all about the sacrificial lamb. Before we dive into this today, what I want you to understand is that Psalm 22 was written about a thousand years before Jesus was even born, and about 600 years before man had even devised this instrument of death called the cross. And yet, as one commentator says, Psalm 22 reads like it was composed at the foot of the cross. So let's dive in. Look at this. Matthew 27, 35 reports when they had crucified him, talking about Jesus, they divided up his clothes by cast, casting lots. A thousand years before that, Psalm 22, verse 18 said, they divide my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. Matthew 27, 39 reports those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads. A thousand years before, Psalm 22, 7 said, all who seek me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. Matthew 27, 43, he trusts in God, let God rescue him now if he wants to, for he said, I'm the son of God. Psalm 22, 8 said, he trusts in the Lord, they say, let the Lord rescue him, let him deliver him since he delights in him. And here's the real kicker that I think leaves absolutely no doubt. Matthew 27, 46 reports about three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, leme sebachthani, which means my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Psalm 22, verse 1, kicks off by saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So one of the many questions you might have in encountering that is, why did Jesus quote Psalm 22 while hanging on the cross? Well, I think he wanted everyone to know that this mysterious psalm that painted the picture, the sacrificial lamb, was being fulfilled in their very presence in that moment. This psalm that prophesied about someone who would come and take on the sins of the world was unfolding before their very eyes. He was stepping up. He was stepping in to receive the punishment that you and I deserved due to our sin. But even beyond taking on the sins of the world, Paul later would say this, he made him who knew no sin to be sin 
in our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus literally became our sin. He became something he had never experienced sin and received something he had never experienced, isolation from his father. And he did all that so that you and I would not have to. He took what we deserved. He's the ultimate substitute. Right now on Wednesday nights, most of my family is up here at church in various capacities, all except for me and my youngest son, Bo. And so we get a couple hours of uninterrupted time together. And one of the things that we've been doing during that time is we've been watching Band of Brothers. He's never seen it before. It's probably the third or fourth time I've watched it. I've read the book a couple times. And every time I watch it, I'm just riveted by this journey that Easy Company takes all the way from boot camp, all the way through dropping in on D-Day, and then all the way to liberating Germany and liberating a a Nazi concentration camp. There's a million different lessons you can learn by reading and watching and studying these men, but the thing that stands out above the rest is one simple and profound word called sacrifice. They literally sacrificed so much so that so many could be free, but even their sacrifice pales in comparison to Jesus and what he's done for us. The exchange that Jesus made is beyond our ability to fathom. It's springtime, the flowers are trying to bloom and the grass is slowly starting to change. Hopefully the weather is going to be warming up and with springtime comes baseball and with baseball comes talk of trades. And I've told you this before, my grandfather on my dad's side was a lifelong Cincinnati Reds fan and he went to his grave complaining about what he said, and many others say, is the worst trade in the history of Major League Baseball. This dates back to 1965 when the Cincinnati Reds uh, traded their star outfielder, Frank Robinson, because they thought he was past his prime at the ripe old age of 30, to the Baltimore Orioles for three players. Those players were Milt Pappas, Jack Baldshun, and Dick Simpson. And after he was traded in the very next season in 1966, Frank Robinson achieved a very rare feat. He won the Triple Crown. He led the league in batting average home runs and RBIs, batted 316, hit 49 home runs, and drove in 122 runs. He won the Triple Crown. And just to rub it in even further, the Baltimore Orioles won the World Series that year. To make matters even worse, four years later, the Baltimore Orioles are back in the World Series, this time facing none other than the Cincinnati Reds with Frank Robinson in their outfield, and they defeated the Cincinnati Reds. If you go to Cooperstown, New York to this day, you will see in the Hall of Fame Frank Robinson's plaque. You know whose plaque you won't find? Any of the three dudes he was traded for. (laughs) It's a bad trade. Very poor trade, but nothing compared to the bad trade that you and I make on a daily basis. Romans chapter one, verse 25, makes it really clear what we do. It says they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than the creator who is forever praised, amen. That exchange has a name and it's simply called sin. Sin happens anytime you and I make a trade to worship something or someone other than the one true God, our creator, and most often what we worship instead of him is ourselves. Just like John Stott said, the essence of sin is man substituting himself for God. In other words, we tried to take his place on the throne, and his response to that was to take our place on the cross. That's overwhelming. Romans chapter 3 is summarized really nicely by Eugene Peterson when he says this, Since we compiled this long and sorry record as sinners and proved that we're utterly incapable of living the glorious lives God wills for us, God did it for us. Out of the sheer generosity, he put us right in standing with himself, a pure gift. He got us out of the mess that we're in and restored us to where he always wanted us to be, and he did it by the means of Jesus Christ. God sacrificed Jesus on the altar of the world to clear that world of sin. Well, in the arena of sports, there's often talk of trades like I've talked about. And the idea behind a, a trade is you want to give up the least to get the most. You want to give up your worst to get the best. Uh, Many of you, I'm sure, know who this person is. This is Ben Johns. He's the number one world pickleball player in the world. Because I know you guys follow this closely ever since I've talked about launching my pickleball career. Uh, You guys have been very uh, interested in this. Many of you offered to coach me in pickleball, so thank you for that. Uh, 
but I did receive a ton of, ton of feedback. And so a bunch of, bunch of our, our guys in my men's group, we decided we were going to go play pickleball. So we went and played for about an hour and a half. And I'm happy to report that while it was not the most extraordinary display of athleticism the world has ever seen, we made it out relatively unscathed without any major injuries, which my wife says is miraculous for a bunch of 40-year-olds to be able to get away with. Since then, I've been playing pickleball every Tuesday morning, been playing doubles, okay? This is my doubles partner. His name is Nate. Many of you know him. He's been on our staff for many years, and mostly I put his picture up here just so you guys could see how inappropriate his short length is. And so, <laughs> so I snapped that candid picture. Everybody cheer for Nate, though. We're the good guys. I mean, yeah, exactly. Now, we, uh, every Tuesday morning, we play the bad guys. This is Brad and Rob. Everybody boo Brad and Rob. Yeah, Brad's a Duke fan. Exactly. See, yeah, I knew, that would, I knew that would help. Now, the reality is if we show up on Tuesday and Ben Johns happens to be there, Nate would be no fool to trade me the worst for the world's best. That simply makes sense. But God, what God did it doesn't make any sense. God traded the best for the worst the world has to offer. He sacrificed the most simply to receive our sin. Jesus stepped in and took our place and became the worst that the world had to offer. And that's why Psalm 22 has such vivid description of what Jesus went through when it says, dogs surround me, a pack of villains encircles me. They pierce my hands and my feet. All my bones are on display. People stare and gloat over me. Why did Jesus direct everyone's attention, mind and hearts to these brutal words while he was hanging on the cross so that we could see and feel both the severity of our sin and the significance of our Savior's love for us? Jesus was clearly saying from the cross, I'm doing this, I'm going through this for you to take your place so that you wouldn't have to. He directed our hearts to this song of lamentation for that reason. And it is a song of lamentation. It revolves around pain and sadness and suffering. But make no mistake, it's also a song of hope. Jesus didn't quote anything or say anything on accident. So my belief is when he said those words from the cross, he knew a few thousand years later people like us would read the rest of Psalm 22, which ends by saying this, the poor will eat and be satisfied. Those who seek the Lord will praise him. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord and all the families of the nations will bow down before him for dominion belongs to the Lord and he rules over the nations. All the rich of the earth will feast and worship. All who go down to the dust will kneel before him. Those who cannot keep themselves alive. Posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord. They will proclaim his righteousness Declaring to a people yet unborn. That's us. And what are they going to declare? He has done it. Which sounds strikingly like these words that Jesus screamed from the cross right before he died. It is what? Finished. It is finished. And I'm sure that people standing at the foot of the cross were thinking, what is done? What is finished? What have you done, Jesus because they couldn't see coming what we can see back and know, which is that he's done it all. He's finished the work. He's done the miraculous. He's finished the impossible. He's done the unthinkable, and he's finished the unimaginable. He stepped in. He took our place and endured the worst. And the question becomes today, now what? What do we do with that? So here's what I know. Many of you came here today across all of our campuses, and you dragged yourself here because of what's going on in your life. And you can resonate with many of the words from Psalm 22, but maybe even especially these words from verse 11 that simply say this, do not be far from me, for trouble is near, and there's no one to help. You see, because Psalm 22 is such an amazing prophecy of Jesus' crucifixion, it can sometimes obscure the fact that simultaneously it was a dramatic reflection of what David was going through when he was inspired to write these words. And we don't know exactly what David was going through, but suffice it to say, he was going through it, whatever it was. 
Someone was after him. Everything God had promised looked like it was going to turn out to be a lie. And so it's no wonder that David used such strong, extreme language to describe his circumstances. And the reality is that while, no, he didn't have wild packs of dogs or lions tearing away to his flesh, his bones weren't literally dislocated, he felt like it. You've been there. And so have I when your circumstances are so brutal, your pain is so deep, your loneliness is so profound that you can't even find the appropriate metaphor or words to describe it. And that's precisely where David was when he wrote this psalm. So perhaps one of the reasons that Jesus quoted it from the cross was to serve as a reminder to anyone and everyone until he came back when you're in the midst of absolute despair, when a loved one takes their life, when a disease has no cure, when the suffering just won't end, when the infertility persists, when everything in you feels like you've been forsaken, you've been abandoned, and there's no one near who's willing, much less capable to help. Look right at me. You see Jesus. You see Jesus. In fact, we have an entire letter in the New Testament that's dedicated to a group of people who were so close to cashing it all in, giving it all up, throwing in the towel. They were right on the edge of abandoning their faith and abandoning Jesus, and it's called Hebrews. I'm studying it right now, and I'm reading this really good kind of little commentary, this little book that'll go alongside of it. I love the title. It's called Holy Grit. Sometimes when I'm reading something, I'll stop after I've underlined and circled and highlighted a bunch of stuff, and I'll just take a picture of a paragraph, not only to serve as a reminder to myself that I want to keep in my phone, but because I know I'm probably going to want to share it with you guys at some point. I wanted to direct your your attention to something the author Chad Ragsdale says. The author of Hebrews doesn't respond to spiritual weariness. Many of you here today, you're spiritually weary. By offering a checklist of good advice on how to recover the joy of the Lord. The author doesn't offer a self-help book with five easy steps to a vibrant faith. He offers Jesus. And I give an amen to that statement. And here's why. Because Hebrews clearly says, yet at present we don't see everything subjected to him. In other words, what we see right now looks like things are out of order. What we see right now looks like things are in chaos. What we see right now doesn't look like God's got the whole world in his hands. It feels like things are falling apart. But we see Jesus. We see Jesus. Now let me tell you why that's such a big deal. I don't think anybody standing at the foot of the cross when Jesus was being crucified was going, yeah, this looks like things are panning out exactly as planned. This looks like this is unfolding exactly the way that God prescribed that it would. Nobody thought that in this moment things are just going really, really well, but it was actually. Like nobody was sitting there going, you know what I think's going on right here? I bet this is that whole penal substitutionary atonement thing that the whole Old Testament law and sacrifices and temple and tabernacle was all pointing to. No, they were just caught up in the misery of the moment. Like you've been, or maybe you are right now, and like I've been. And that's why I don't like to patronize people. I don't like to patronize people when I preach with five easy steps to, you know, you doing your best life or you do the best you or power positive thinking or any of that stuff. Not your guy for that kind of, if you can even call it that, preaching. Here's all I know to do. All I know to do as a preacher is to point you to Jesus. That's all I ever want to do is point you to Jesus. Because all that other stuff falls desperately short when life gets brutal. I've never preached a funeral service full of self-help checklists. I've preached plenty that are all about and only about Jesus. And the author of Hebrews wanted to make clear that when everything around you looks like it's out of control, when it feels like God's taking his hands off the wheel and it's turning into a disaster, the author is saying, but we see Jesus. When the world around us seems to have lost its collective mind in believing a lie that the next election is the most important event in all of human history, y'all, we see Jesus. When we feel emotionally abandoned and our hearts are broken, we see Jesus. When temptation is fierce and the night gets long and dark, we see Jesus. Because there is no more event more significant 
No betrayal more scandalous, no temptation more overwhelming than what Jesus went through on my behalf and in your place. And if we can only fix our hearts and our minds and our eyes on Jesus, we can develop out of that true grit. That's why the author of Hebrews says, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary, you will not lose heart. And if you're here today going, man, I don't want to grow weary. I don't want to lose heart. I don't want to cash out. I don't want to give up. I don't want to throw in the towel. Then what the author of Hebrews is saying is, all right then, then fix your eyes, rivet your attention on Jesus. Because the great temptation that you and I are going to face and that we are facing as suffering is accelerated and as pain is accentuated and as the road home seems longer by the day is for us to lose nerve or lose heart. Here's what I mean. We're going to talk more about this in the fall, but as our circumstances as a church begin to look more and more like the circumstances of the very first church, and what I mean is when following Jesus comes at a real cost, when it becomes deeply offensive to our cultural hall monitors that we call Jesus King, when believing what Jesus says is true and right, when Talking about the Bible becomes a form of hate speech when holding on to the very things that Jesus told us to hold on to become at the very least unpopular but probably punishable, many of us are going to be tempted to lose our nerve. And what I mean by that is we'll be tempted to back down, we'll be tempted to hide and change our beliefs and cower to a culture in hopes of being left alone. And what that means is we'll take our eyes off of Jesus, but when we do that, our eyes will be fixed on self-preservation, self-satisfaction, and self-promotion. And I know that because that's where the human heart always gravitates when we take our eyes off Jesus. And it's a clear and present danger and reality right now. And it explains the onset of certain things like progressive Christianity, which ironically is neither progressive nor Christian. It explains buzzwords like deconstruction. In case you're wondering what that is, the technical definition of it is simply this, the postmodern process of rethinking your faith, and here's the key, without regarding scripture as a standard. In other words, shockingly, when we throw the Bible out the window, our faith is soon to follow. The other great temptation, though, that we'll face is to lose heart, and we'll lose compassion, and we'll lose love, and we'll lose sympathy for lost and broken people. We'll be tempted to harden our hearts and circle the wagons, and it'll sound really alluring to batten down the hatches while the world burns and simply try to protect our own, and we'll avert our eyes from our Savior, try to save ourselves, and in so doing, abandon the mission of our Savior to seek and save the lost that he told us we had to join him in if we were going to claim to be his followers. So the author of Hebrews is saying, don't lose nerve, don't lose heart, fix your eyes on Jesus. And we can do that because we know that on the other side of the brutality of the cross was an empty grave. I was sitting in my office writing this sermon earlier this week and a lot of times I'll have music kind of playing in the background and as I was sitting and thinking, an old hymn came on called The Wonderful Cross. And I thought to myself, you know, that title would have struck a lot of people as very strange before Jesus rose from the grave. I mean, it would have been like having a, a song called, Oh, the Wonderful Electric Chair. Wouldn't have made any sense until Jesus went to that cross and Jesus vacated that grave. Originally, the song was written by Sir Isaac Watson, was adapted a bit by Chris Tomlin, but one of my favorite stanzas is simply this. It's the beauty and the shame. It's the glory and the name. Oh, the wonderful cross. How could a cross be wonderful? Because of who's on it. Because of what he's doing while he's on it. He was accomplishing what you and I could never accomplish for ourselves. He was finishing a work that he had started years ago. My family, just my wife and I and two babies at the time, we packed up from 
Lexington, Kentucky, moved all the way out to Colorado to be a part of a little church that was meeting in an old feed store in Boulder County. Picture like a tractor supply that had been hollowed out and the stage slapped up to the front and just seats just packed into the place, some sit, sitting right behind poles. People would have to look around like an old school ballpark and people would sit in the aisles and stand in the aisles and sit in the lobby and sit on the porch and the patio outside under the hot Colorado sun sometimes. One of the first things I noticed in that place is under every row and scattered all throughout that auditorium were tissue boxes just everywhere. And here's why. Because in every single service in that place, for years, tears flowed freely at the realization of two vital things, and this happened for people for the very first time so often for so long in that place, and it was the realization of the horror of sin and the hope of the cross. And both are vital. And if we fix our eyes on Jesus, not just every day, but every hour of every day, we'll endure whatever that day may bring. And so that's one of the reasons we drag ourselves in here week after week to celebrate and remember that. It's one of the reasons that those of us who are followers of Jesus, we do this really kind of what seems like a strange thing, I'm sure, to some people, where we, we take this little piece of bread, we take this juice, and we eat, and we drink. It's called communion. If you have that with you today, go ahead and take that out. As we direct our hearts towards something Jesus told us to direct our hearts to as often as we would get together. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 10 says this, we've been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus. And so we take and we eat this bread to remember his body. Take the bread together now. Likewise, Hebrews 10 19 says, we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of of Jesus. Jesus told us to take this cup and remember his blood. So let's all drink together. Join me as we pray. Father God, we're grateful. We're so grateful for the work that you've done. You've done it all on our behalf. You sent your one and only son, Jesus, to accomplish something that we could not accomplish for ourselves. And so we gather here today so grateful. And we can have confidence today, Father, not because of who we are or because of what we've done, but because of who you are and what you've done. So we have joy even in the midst of pain. And we can face the rest of today because of you and the strength and the hope that we have. Thank you that we can gather strength from being together in this place across all of our campuses, knowing that many of us are facing the same temptation, struggles, and challenges, and knowing that we all experience this beautiful thing called grace together. We love you. You're a good father. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. a rich I remember who I was I was lost I was blind I was running out of time and sin separated the breach was far too wide but from the far side of the chasm you held me in your sight so you the great divide left behind heaven's throne to build it here inside and there at the cross you paid the debt I owe broke my chains freed my soul for the first time I had hope thank you Jesus for the blood of life. Thank you, Jesus. It has washed me wild. Thank you, Jesus. You have saved my
my place, laid inside my tomb of sin. You were buried for three days, but then you walked right out again. And now death has no sting, and life has no end. For I have been transformed by the blood. Continue to worship together. We're going to sing about the cross. Let's stand together. Let's sing this out. Let's all sing together. All my shame. All my shame was filled with mercy. And now your mercy will be my song.
top this morning off with a couple of baptisms, so if you guys will have a seat and turn your attention to the baptistry. All right, this is my friend Jacob, and Jacob, uh, he just informed me he's got four sisters, and so we're going to pray extra for him today, so really, uh, really cool talking to you back there and hear about how you came about making this decision, and then when we're done here, you're going to go to Harry's and eat some sushi, so yeah, fifth grader who loves sushi, I like that, so. Jacob, just one question for you. Do you believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and have you accepted him as your Lord and Savior? Yes. Right, repeat after me. I believe, I believe with all my heart, with all my heart that, Jesus that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, my Lord, my, Lord, my, Savior. my Savior. Jacob, because of that confession, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit for the forgiveness of your sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. Death, burial, <laughs> resurrection. This is my friend Lila. She's a first grader at Wilmore Elementary. We had the honor of being her teachers in the big picture show. And today Lila's come to give her life to Jesus in baptism. So Lila, do you believe Jesus is the Christ, the yes. Son of the living God, <laughs> your Lord and your Savior? All right, based on that, I want you to repeat after me. I believe, I believe with all my heart, with all my heart that Jesus is the Christ. Son of the living God, my Lord and my Savior. Okay, based on that confession, I'm going to baptize you, so step down. Put your, cover your lips. All right. Well, based on that, content, that confession, I'm going to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Death, burial, and resurrection. <laughs> Y'all, our, our prayer team is available down here at the front. They'd love to pray with you or talk with you this morning. It's been awesome to see you guys today. Hope you have a great week. We'll see you next Sunday.